Hello, Renegade Marketers. Welcome to Renegade Marketers Unite, the top-rated podcast for B2B CMOs and other marketing-obsessed individuals. You're about to listen to a recording of Renegade Marketers Live, our live show featuring the CMOs of CMO Huddles, a community that's sharing, caring, and daring each other to greatness every day of the week. This time, we've got a conversation with Melissa Goldberger of Safe Breach, James B. Stanton of Empyrean, and Jamie Walker of Key Factor. In this episode, you'll learn all about how they structure their marketing teams, how they build culture remotely, and what they're thinking about in recruiting and retention. You'll also learn about their super cool paths to becoming CMOs. It's a great episode. Let's dive in. I'm your host, Drew Neiser, live from my home studio in New York City. In his seminal book, Good to Great, Business Guru, I know that book's back there somewhere, so see if you can find it. Jim Collins identified that a great leader's first priority is getting the right people in the right seats on the bus, even before you figure out where the bus should be going. Great leaders assemble great teams, and most CMOs will agree that they are only as effective as the teams they build which is why at every award ceremony for marketing, you'll always hear the CMO say, and I want to thank my team. And it's not a cliche, but it's with most things marketing, it's just not that simple. First, hiring experience direct reports has never been harder, especially if you're looking for a head of marketing ops or a head of product marketing. Second, given all the roles that marketing can play, figuring out the optimal org design is a challenge for even the most experienced CMOs. So over the course of four huddles, we reviewed org designs of dozens of huddlers, and not surprisingly, no two were exactly alike. Some of these variations reflect the company's target markets, while others the priorities or biases of the CMOs. So on today's episode, we're going to tackle brewing a strong B2B marketing team, looking for tips and tricks that you can bring to your organization. With that, let's bring on Melissa Goldberger, CMO of Safe Breach. Hello, Melissa. Hi, Drew. How are you? I'm good. How are you? And and where are you? I'm actually in Palm Beach, Florida. So yeah, one of the only positive effects, right, of COVID moving. That's there it. you go. I was looking at your LinkedIn profile and noticed that you actually started your career in the United Nations. And I'm pretty sure that's the only CMO I know who did that. Can you talk about that experience and, and relate to maybe... How'd you end up in marketing? Definitely was not where I thought I was going to be after college. I thought I was going into the foreign service. I'm going to save the world. Got my job at the UN and basically was tasked with creating, 9-11 had just happened. There was funding around bringing a program called Global Classrooms into inner city public schools. So I was tasked with starting our New York program. So it meant everything from recruiting teachers in public schools who were like, I have enough on my plate. I don't think if you remember No Child Left Behind, that was probably uh, you know, all they cared about was the tests. And we had to bring over a thousand students into this program. And we had 2000 our first year. And my boss said, well, now I need that in my three other cities where she had other consultants. Over five years, we grew to 26 cities. It was wow. a pure marketing play and not, it was mostly marketing to the public schools, the teachers and the foundations. So it was really, it taught me not only the B2C side, right, of working with the teachers, but the B2B side, because we were also integrating with partners. We had our funders. And I spent my first half of my career in nonprofit. Like, what a crazy ride is that to be a CMO, to say. Um, right, but yeah, it's... to go from the UN to not, well, UN nonprofit and then nonprofit to very much for profit. So fast forward to your role at Safe Breach. Can you kind of provide an overview of your team structure, how many direct reports you have and what areas they're, they're serving? Yeah, so our team structure, um, I'm reporting into the CEO. We total, as a team total right now, we're 13, though, with the four four more open recs and we're going to be 20 by the end of the year. I have six direct reports now and it's pretty much your typical, right? We have, we're heavier right now in content and product marketing because we have a huge gap there. Demand gen, we have head of SDR, global marketing because we have a lot of expansion happening as well as my favorite one to hire, marketing ops. And is to your point, the hardest. Yeah. And I love the, the optimism of saying, okay, we have 13 now, we're going to be 20 by the end of the year. What we're hearing in huddles, it can consistently in the last two months is you make three offers and you could get three acceptances 
and then people turn you down. I mean, it's crazy. So just hiring uh, seven people between now and the end of the year will be heroic. And when you think about your structure, what are you feeling good about? What's working pretty well? I think just the overall collaboration and alignment with sales. Our structure is really aligned to the growth of our sales team. You know, I know that horrific hiring. Right now, when I came on board in August, I had three. It was myself and three. We had six sales reps. Our sales organization grew from June 2021 to today. It is now 40 with 20 open racks. So we have to make sure that we're aligned. Whatever I'm bringing in in the team is going to be aligned to deliver. We're very sales focused and very customer focused organization. And every position I think of is how many reps is it going to be to a field marketer? How many reps for my content folks? Because we have to be four steps ahead. We have to enter market six months ahead of time. So I have to be looking really far out with our CRO. And that alignment has been huge. And also internally within the team, just creating those interactions. We don't have silos on my team. I hope we can keep that as we grow. I mean, I've had larger teams. When I was at Argyle, I had 40 and we still managed to break those silos within different cross-functional projects. So I'm hoping we could still keep that. I really skipped over the fact that the SDRs report to you. Those are sales development reps as if for anybody who doesn't use that particular grammar. And not every CMO has them do that. I think it's a great idea because then you know that those folks have to get from what looks like a lead and really make it into something that sales will run with. But it's a different breed of folks. Oh my God. Yeah. And to your point of those accepting roles and declining, SDR used to be my, we grade when we have to hire and how long we think it'll take. SDR, I could usually fill super fast. That's where I had a harder problem with that than product marketing. Pro- my product marketer, I brought her in in six weeks. She's fabulous. Wow. And my SDRs are amazing. It took fine tuning. And I know we'll maybe discuss a little bit later. It definitely took some fine tuning to get those offers for people not to reject them um, of me actually showing comp plans in the second interview and me interviewing. Normally, I wouldn't interview an SDR. They have a manager. They usually, we have them meet with someone in sales, a peer. But we found having me interview them really got them excited about their future and which directions they can go. And also being honest about what this role is and isn't. Like, listen, it's a lot of digging. It's finding that, you know, needle in a haystack. And I'm really proud of our SDR team. They, they're they amazing. And it's a newer team for us. It's interesting. I, there, you said a couple of things that I just want to put punctuation points on. The fact that you're doing the interviewing, the fact that you're road mapping with them and compensation is like crazy. So you got to be upfront with that in terms of competitive... Uh, Uh, salary. So all of those things have come up in huddles quite a bit lately. But again, I think the notion that there's a career here for you, or at least there's more than six months for you. So let's see, we've got, we've covered that. What kinds of things have you done to help your team work together more effectively in the last six months? Because I'm imagining it's remote and and this is really a challenge. It's funny, I was listening to a gentleman the other night who is a managing partner at a huge, huge PE firm. And his statement was, look, retention is about staying and working with people that you like, but you can't get people together. So how are you creating those bonds? Well, I mean, we definitely, we probably have too many meetings. I will say that there's definitely a lot of meetings um, remote and it's really stepping out of the way and then let each individual own certain areas and even areas where I may be having a gap. I'll tell you, it's funny. If you had asked me 10 years ago, I was the most organized, your best project manager, like on top of everyone. I used to stay, I had this one boss. I was like, I will never be that all over the place. I am that all over the place right now. But talking to someone on my team and letting them know that I need their help to lead our weekly project management to take that to own that and to bring those discussions together so we have the team with quick stand up on monday we have a strategy meeting on wednesday and that one is my meeting and that's it and being respectful of their time we do get together i mean i'll be honest we've brought in a lot of new people to our team and we did have some hiccups bringing some new people in right off the bat and right when they were what i call a firecracker before it's an explosion we were able you know first on zoom getting together okay what are the challenges how can we break this down and we were fortunate enough where we all did go to Sunnyvale. We all sat together as a team and we roadmapped the next quarter's marketing plans together, the entire team. And we just actually had our sales kick off two weeks ago. Fortunately, 200 people and we all managed to be together. So we're really fortunate right now in this time that we've been able to be together a bit. Yeah. A CMO that, uh, that I know brought their team together. And sure enough, that individual had COVID 
and was mortified that uh, they might have given it to their team. So it's a trick. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, we do a lot of testing. We joke no one tests more for COVID than our team. Even our SCO, we had someone on-site doing on-site testing for us. Yeah, yeah, I know. That's hard, but that makes a lot of sense. Okay, we're going to come back. But right now, we're going to bring on James B. Stanton, CMO of Empyrean. Hello, James. How are you? I'm doing well. Drew and yourself. I'm doing great. I see we are of the standing folks, which I, I think is awesome because you can always tell of the people who are standing because their head is like right at the top of the screen. So I was looking at your LinkedIn profile again, and I noticed that you got an MFA from Parsons and I think invented laser light musical instruments. That's kind of cool. What happened back then? You've been stalking my LinkedIn profile again. I have, you know, searching <laughs> the world for something interesting. Yeah, no, that's reeling in the years a little bit there. But yeah, I had an amazing experience at Parsons. And uh, I am a musician. One of the uh, areas that I investigated, this was a, a digital degree. And one of the areas that I was investigating was laser light control and wavelength and the correlation between sound and digital and wave and all these kind of things came together. And yeah, I created uh, some pretty interesting instruments that controlled, allowed the user to control how laser move, laser light moved through different types of plastics and things that you could see. And then it was all connected through to these sound boards, right, that would trigger sounds on and off. And as you can see, that was a very direct correlation between what I did then and now leading a B2B marketing team selling Absolutely. HR software. <laughs> All you're doing is you're just sort of instead of laser light, you're sort of using your mind meld uh, technique to, uh, <laughs> That's right. That's to get right. your team to orchestrate, so to speak. That's a uh, word I like to use a lot. There you go. And I can't help but notice that there is a guitar. I think I see the neck of a guitar back there somewhere. Yes, there it is. I've got a gu guitar over there. And then I get a lot of grief for the lute uh, that is over my, my <laughs> other shoulder. <laughs> you know, there just aren't enough lute players. So uh, anyway, let's get back to 2022. Give an overview of your team at Empyrean. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, by the numbers, I have seven direct reports. Our total team here is of 15. This is a team that I've had the pleasure to build since I joined Empyrean in October of 2020, so right in the heart of the pandemic. Beyond the, the numbers and the org structure, I'd be happy to talk about that too, but my goal in creating a team is to create one that's highly energized, very collaborative, and that can create and do you know amazing things together. As a shout out for uh, any, anyone on my team that might be listening, I mean, I am so lucky and thrilled and humbled to have such an amazing and talented team of people that I get to work with. Interestingly, we've really worked hard together as we've created this new team. Marketing is a, a newer function at Empyrean as we've envisioned it now. And we've worked really hard together to create what we kind of call a marketing microculture. And we've even defined something that we call the Empyrean marketing way. For those of you that are fans of uh, Simon Sinek. We took that same approach to how we defined our culture with our why, our how, and our what, right? With our why, it's our mission statement. You know, it's our purpose and belief as a marketing team. Then how we go about doing what we do and what we bring to the table to, to accomplish what needs to get done. A theme that runs across all of that is accountability. And we talk a lot about that, right? Having accountability to each other, accountability to the organization, accountability to ourselves. What's been really important for, for me and for all of us on the team is to create, and you may have heard this mantra before, but clear roles and common goals, right? I like it because it rhymes, but it also works really well when thinking about how to set up a team and an organization. I found that some of you might relate. We marketers, we tend to be yes people, right? We're the, the folks that are always there to get things done and we take a lot on. And that can get really challenging um, if we all end up 
taking on projects that have too much overlap and overlay with what each other are doing. So we spend a lot of time making sure that we're clear on what we're responsible for and then how we work with each other to, to accomplish what we take, take over the finish line. So I'm, I'm actually, I'm not sure I may have deviated Drew from. No, it's all good. It's all good. So I, and I'm just going to make a couple of punctuation points. One of the things that really is important as a CMO that I have observed is providing air cover for your people. And so you've got to be the one who says no to things. And so you've already covered the importance of priorities and accountability. And so there's always an infinite number of things that you can do. And sales will always ask for yet another presentation or a custom thing or something like that. And if it's not on the plan and you're not all working on it together as part of the thing, it's just, you got to learn to say no. And it's funny, one CMO and Huddles mentioned, he's got seven different ways of saying no. <laughs> <laughs> which I think is is brilliant. So when you think about this real quick, it sounds like a lot of things are working really well, but I'm a little concerned for you. Seven direct reports is a lot. Like <laughs> I think it's kind of one too many. And I'm just sort of curious how you decided on that number. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that for me, I like to have a flat organization, right? I tend when I uh, put out org charts and, and use them um, in a strategic way, I, I tend to put out a circle and kind of my role is the, the line in between everybody ho holding folks together, creating a direction, reducing and removing friction. And I do like to have um, a, a personal connection and a hand in all that we're doing here, we're accomplishing here. It is, you know, a large number, but what I've also been able to create here, again, with that kind of culture of, of accountability that we all strive towards, I have a team of experts, right? I, I have people in my direct reports that are all able to accomplish what they need to accomplish largely on their own, right? Filling in gaps that, that, that I have, right? Certainly I'm not an expert at everything by any extent. And so I see my role in working with all these folks is to make sure that, to borrow the word that you used earlier, right? That we're orchestrated and that we're all working against, we use OKRs here uh, on the team, right? So that we all are aligned on our objectives and everybody brings those to the table. And that's how I found that, again, keeping a bit of a flatter organization, I feel allows me to, to be a bit more effective, but you're right. It isn't, I have a lot of one-on-ones every week. Well, and I was going to say, that's where it really sort of runs out. You just run out of time because you're career mapping. But I, that punctuation point I want to put on this is as a CMO, particularly if you're new and you're going in and you've been told, Hey, there really wasn't a demand gen function here. We haven't really worked. It's been a sales driven or product driven organization. And now we want to, you know, get marketing in the forefront. One thing that you you mentioned is team of experts. And if just, I'm going to stop there and say, as a CMO, if every one of your direct reports really knows that area, you have a possibility of managing your time. One of the expressions I love that was used in one of the huddles was you can't outwork this job. You simply can't. So you got to get team members who are really good. And so, you know, the first order of business is going in and just building a layer underneath you that can do everything they need to do in their area. So that's a very cool thing. So are you back at the office or hybrid or remote or what are you doing in that space? Yeah. So when, when I joined, as I, I mentioned, right in the thick of things of COVID, I joined remote. The team was uh, also partially remote already, but uh, a few other folks were out of our headquarters. And what was important for me joining is I really actually wanted to create a team of the best people that I could find no matter where they were, right? Back to that team of experts. So that meant that I, I had to be geographically unbounded regardless of the, the pandemic, to, to be honest. My manager, the chief strategy officer, was, was very supportive, right, of that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we have created a remote team. We've got folks all over the country. We do have a very structured way of working together, though. We are hybrid, or excuse me, we are an agile marketing team. So we meet on Mondays and do our commits. Uh, we meet on Fridays and do our completes. Very different style of meeting and tone, as you can imagine, each one of those. And then dur during the week, we all work off of a Trello kind of Kanban style board which has been a fantastic way to keep everybody who's, you know, remote 
um, all of us being remote together and on the same page and being able to tap help when we need it and share and have accountability and, and, and get to the finished project in manageable chunks. But we do get together. Uh, we've been calling it our marketing residency. We pick one of our offices and we get together. We've been averaging, you know, with pandemic and, you know, some COVID scaring and Melissa I hear you on testing and being worried if we've had some outbreaks. But we try to get together. Um, you know, my aspiration is quarterly or really three times a year. And those are awesome moments, right? We, we come together, we have some fun, um, and uh, we also use that time to think way more expansively to really let the creative juices flow. As one of my team members said recently, I think getting together at this break is enough. Because if we got together more often, we wouldn't have enough time to get done the things we actually come up with, right? Yeah, you wouldn't miss each other. That's amazing. Thanks for all of that. Let's welcome Jamie Walker, CMO of Key Factor. Hello, Jamie. Hello, Drew. How are you? I am doing great. Now, so where are you? I am in sunny Atlanta. Sunny, warm, oh. soon to be very hot Atlanta. Hot Atlanta is... Uh... Hot Atlanta. Is everyone who's not from Atlanta calls it hot Atlanta. I realized a few years ago when I moved here. Yeah, well, I'm for a good cause. But so uh, again, I was sort of plumbing the uh, your LinkedIn profile and noticed that I think your first three jobs were in sales. And I can relate to that having... I, don't know, I sold encyclopedias door to door one year in college. And I even the year before that, I sold Time Life books over the phone. So I get it. I'm, I'm just wondering if you think having been in sales made you a better marketer. And if so, how? Yeah. I mean, so coming out of college, I was your typical athlete who had never worked. So I was like, what am I going to do? So I ended up in sales and I I did carry encyclopedias, but I did have a, a bag where I was selling insurance and door to door in rural Vermont. So I definitely think that teaches you to have some thick skin. You hear no more than you hear yes. And it also teaches you to live by a number. And so I guess at the time I didn't realize that in my early twenties, but now very much later in life, I realize I can respect what the sales team and each individual goes through on a monthly quarterly basis and having to meet a number to sustain their livelihood. So I think it has taught me a lot to understand Understand the other side of the story, especially now being in the B2B world and working with, uh, you know, my head of sales and understanding his team and what they need and how we need to support them. Oh, I love the live by a number. I remember distinctly our, our sort of coach who would drop us off at some apartment building complex and said, you knock on a hundred doors, you will sell at least one. That was one out of a hundred you'd sell and you could do that in a day. And then the other thing that I thought was hilarious was the expression, no callbacks. And, and this was one that I just have to share this. So one time, you know, you go in there, you get everybody all excited. They're ready to do it. And they say, but can you come back tomorrow? <laughs> and so, uh, you know, our manager said, there are no callbacks. You either sell that moment or don't. And of course, the next day I go and, you know, they wouldn't open the door. So no callbacks. Anyway. That's funny. I think about that now, Drew, when I'm on, we you know, I'm on calls with vendors trying to obviously get me to purchase software. I'm always like, I need to think about it. But at the same time, it brings me back to the days where I never wanted to hear that from someone. Exactly. Because it really means no, not now. It's not important. I, I got to go. It's hilarious how those things stick with you. So talk a little bit about your structure of your team right now. Yeah, absolutely. So right now I have, there's about 14 of us on the team. By the end of the year, we'll hopefully be up to 16. I recently hired five people. So we've gone, th I've gone through a crazy Q1 of bringing on five new roles. So I feel like it's been quite a journey. I was hearing kind of about the direct reports and some of the other SCMOs that are here today. And I, right now I have six, but I'm so happy to say in exactly 30 days, I will have four because I have finally landed that my VP of growth demand general. So that was a huge blessing uh, for me to be able to, to find a little relief for the team. But a lot of positive things going on at Key Factor right now. I want to hear them. What's working? Yeah. I mean, we kind of grew by 100% over last year. We, I have a new team over in Stockholm. We've hired an EMEA lead. We we're, we're definitely have a strong global presence. So, you know, business as usual has changed. The way that our team has structured, the way we communicate, the way that we get together has all changed since I've, I've been at Key Factor. I think similar to other people, I started in the pandemic. I came on, we had a small team. It's been growing. And we've had, you know, the challenge of 
growing in a way we always grow we align with sales so that's going really well our numbers we're, we're always meeting them but you have to really focus on how is your team growing as you add more people how does that team dynamic change how does the communication style change how do i as a leader need to you know where do i insert myself where do i kind of back where do i back off so i have invested heavily on just really focusing on building the team but from a place of understanding the personalities and communication that needs to happen bringing in you know executive coach. I brought an executive coach. I budgeted this year so I could have someone that could really help us focus on what does it take to sustain. And I say sustain because I have a very functioning team right now. Everyone is high performing. But as you grow and as you add new personalities to that, that changes. And so it's about understanding everyone's role, which I think is what we do by nature as leaders, but also understanding like how we need to work, how, what are operating principles as a team? What are our goals internally for being able to grow and sustain the demands of the business that we all know as marketers we get day in and day out, but also making sure we're cohesively moving in, in the right motion. I think it's so interesting that you have, so here's your team, you're describing everything's really working and you bring in an executive coach while things are good. First of all, I admire that. I'm wondering how, how was that greeted by your boss and how did you package and position that? Because I think a lot of CMOs would love to do that, but don't necessarily know how to argue for it. Well, I didn't have to argue for it. It was a coach that worked with some of our executive leaderships and team. So she was already well established in the organization. And I just set, had built my case. I had said, hey, we're, we went through an MA. There's a lot of change that happens in an organization, let alone marketing. And I'm about to bring on a lot of new people and we have a big year ahead of us. And to do that right, I want to sustain, I want to keep our positioning of where we are today. I didn't have to fight for it. It's my budget. They said, okay, sounds good. And I just make sure that I talk to my boss and say, hey, here's what I'm working on with X person in this group. And everything is, I feel like as long as the numbers are met, everyone's open to a conversation about what happens after that. You know, I'd be remiss and I, cause you, you mentioned early on and I just sort of skipped over that, that you were an athlete. What sports did you, what'd you play? I played basketball. At the college level? Yeah. So I said, I, I literally never worked a day in my life until I graduated college. I, you know, all I had to do was play and, you know, it felt good at the time, but when you go into the workforce, I remember I was at school, I got, I have a psych degree. I got a human resource management certificate. So I thought I was going to get into human resources and I couldn't even get an entry level job. So that's kind of like your path is kind of, but it all makes sense because I could never picture myself in human resources. I want to do a shout out on this because, you know, one of the things I've gotten to know over the years is that college level athletes athletes who also graduate with their degree, who know they're, who may or may not have sights on playing professional, have to be so organized in order to, because it's a full-time job being a, a basketball player or a football player and being a student. And so you have a full, you know, you, you don't have a life. You got to be really, really organized. Do you see yourself sometimes going, well, God, I did so much more in college because I did any of those skills that you learned in terms of time management, you think they're paying off for you now? They must. You know, I actually have never, correlated those two together but I think back on when I was in college and I had full course load traveling practices you know early mornings it was just kind of what I knew and I think that has created the I think the person I am of like how much you can balance and how much you can withstand and so everyone even you know like now at this point in my life and, and in career and my, my team looks at me and they're like Jamie does it all I'm like well it's just this is who I am I don't really feel like I do it all but between work and family and all of that it's just kind of what we do as people so I do think that there's a part of who people are in generally who get to that level there's a mindset to get to that level to play a college sport and kind of be that immersed so I think there's a mindset mindset part of it that is definitely carried over with me and probably is a big reason of where I am today. But I hadn't really thought about it, Drew, until you mentioned it. No, I, I think, you know, I think college athletes get a, a bum rap sometimes. And I'm just so, so impressed by so many of the ones that I meet. They're so much more organized and accomplished and goal oriented and they're competitive. And those are all really good things. And oh, by the way, five people, all of you matter. It's a team sport. Okay. Uh, as much as I like to talk about this, talk a little bit about what kinds of things other than the coach are you kind of doing to help your team work as a team? Yes, absolutely. So like most people that are kind of here chatting today, having a team, we're remote, we're global, we're all over the place. And so 
the business at Key Factor in general is really great at, of allowing us to move as we feel comfortable, as you feel comfortable traveling. We have all hands meetings, you know, monthly in all locations. So one thing that I have done and I allow the team to do is we kind of pick places where we're going to meet as a team around those all hands meetings. Uh, so that's one way we do it on a monthly basis. Again, it's a choice. It's not required that you go, but if you want to have human interaction and want to see someone you see all day on Teams any other given day, uh, you can go and meet. And then we have dinners around that. The other thing that I did, which I think it was more around the timing of bringing new people and having a global team is we had our first marketing global kickoff here in Atlanta back in March. And so, you know, the goal similar to what James was saying is like, yes, we want to have fun, but it was around aligning around strategically. We have, you know, five new people we have, we're already marching to our orders as a business as we're, you know, already basically through Q1. How do we ramp people up? How do we get people to break bread and just build that trust. And I think that's a really important piece of it is building trust with your teammates. And so it was a two day, pretty packed two day. We did a wine tasting with one of the, I forget what it's called, where you, is it Saber? Where you kind of like take the champagne bottle off with a sword. We did one of those things. Oh, fun. <laughs> Yeah, we just made sure we had fun and had, you know, we worked really hard during the day and it was an opportunity for the team to be able to talk about what they were working on, but it was also a chance for us to talk and for me to set the stage of, you know, what is their role in the business and what is everyone's role and how we're, you know, we're in this together and, you know, the commitment that I have to the team and that in each individual has to each other. And it was just really powerful. And I think that's, again, it's the breaking bread and having wine goes a really long way when you do it often. <laughs> It really does. And, I, and yeah. I'm just going to say this for everyone, the connections that your team make and the bonds that they feel will determine how long they stay at your company. Okay. If you don't mind, I'm going to plug CMO Huddles for a second. Launched in 2020, CMO Huddles is an invitation only subscription service that brings together elite B2B CMOs to share care and dare each other to greatness. We're asking for like one hour a month to give you 10 back in smarter, faster, Faster, better decisions. We don't know another CMO peer group that's actually delivering on the level that we're talking about here. So check out cmohuddles.com. And I want to bring, you know, Melissa, James, Jamie, you're you're all huddlers. You're, some of you are more new to it, but feel free to share your experiences with CMO Huddles. I'm a bit uh, newer to this, as you know, but it's been great. It's a safe place for sure. It's also, uh, I found incredibly helpful just to hear about some of the same problems that, that I'm having and some novel, you know, approaches and paths uh, to success. And even if you miss a meeting, Drew, to, you know, the great write-ups that you do, some of that has been helpful for me and even justifying some of the things I'm trying to accomplish here. So I've used what I've learned to talk to my CEO and get justification and dollars for things I'm trying to do. So yeah, it's been, it's been great. That's awesome. Jamie, Melissa. I'm going to times two that on James because I would agree for me personally. I think I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a bit newer. And so I struggle sometimes to always make the huddles, but the email that Drew sends behind it is amazing. I always kind of search back when I have a topic that I'm thinking about, I search back to that and see kind of what are other people saying. But I would also agree that like the ones that I have joined, it's really nice to have a safe space. We're all doing the same thing. We all have similar challenges and it's nice to either A, not feel alone <laughs> or B, learn some new ways to think about things that you may have not been thinking about in that certain way. Awesome. Melissa. I was going to say, I love the Slack channel, actually. I'm, I, I am obsessed with Slack. I don't know what happened like last year. I was like, I hate Slack. It was the worst thing in the world and now all of a sudden I'm obsessed with it but I love the channel in addition to the emails I think sometimes I've always gotten a response when I need something I feel like there's always a huddler there to help and it's and it's different than some more of the open groups that there are because like we have a cybersecurity society, which is amazing, and I love it. My team's in it. They're amazing. They get engaged in it. But, you know, I can't sometimes ask more of those, you know, closed questions where I need that safe space. So I love that term safe space. And that's really what that Slack channel gives to me. So it's a really great group. I love the different ways of communication as well. Thank you all for those. So let's talk a little bit about the challenge of retention. I mean, we literally had a huddle yesterday where one of the CMOs shared that a person that they had worked with for like 11 years just left because they got a $70,000 increase <laughs> in raise. And so, and it's just this reshuffling. 
And what was interesting is they were losing to large companies like AWS and Microsoft were just throwing money at people. So I'm wondering if anything that you all have tried has been working on the retention front. Personally, I haven't lost anyone for someone leaving for more money. <laughs> I've lost people for them growing their careers and going to be CMOs. And so that, that to me is just joyous and that's a happy thing. But as far as I'd say how I feel like I focus more on retention with my the people is I do a lot of conversations around career development, around where we're at, where we're going to go. Just very, to be an open book about it and not have it be like, oh, we only talk about this once a quarter. I generally am pretty, I guess, just open with my direct reports and the people I'm at. They're very, I'm very authentic. I'm, I'm a feeler by nature. And so I just tend, and I'm a chatter. I'm a chatty person as well. So, you know, I'm, I like to build trust, but I also want to be my authentic self. And I think that sometimes that works for organizations and maybe that's worked for, you know, me, be, me being able to retain some people who could easily leave and probably go make 70 grand somewhere else. Well, and I do want to just make the point that if you can build a reputation as a CMO, as a CMO maker, that's a really good thing because you're always going to be able to attract that layer right below you that wants to get groomed to to be the next CMO. And I, I think there are a lot of those folks out there. James, anything on your world that's kind of working from a retention standpoint? Yeah, sure. So similar point, Jamie, right? The uh, having folks leave to go take on, you know, a bigger and better role, that that's awesome, right? That that's a high high five moment. I'm kind of in a lucky position right right now in that we have been re-engineering and rebuilding um, the marketing team here at Empyrean. So uh, it's been more of a, an attraction than, than a retention. But I do agree with, Jamie, your, your point there too, right? It's important as a leader to have a very open and candid relationship with the folks on your team. I want to have those conversations and I make it known I want to have those conversations. If you're feeling, right, that you're not connected, if you feel like you're not getting the growth that you, that you need, or if you feel like you're undercompensated, right? So I try and give that uh, space, right, for that conversation in one-on-ones, um, not every one-on-one, but I kind of pick one, you know, about sort of mo every month-ish kind of cadence to just ask and, and be open to that. And making sure, again, the other point of on the microculture uh, that we have and feeling connected to a mission, I think that's also critical, you know, myself included, right, to keep everybody connected, engaged, and all working together for something, you know, for a greater good. Love it. Okay, Melissa, anything in, in retention that's sort of working for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I want to echo what James said about that microculture. I think it's really <laughs> interesting in terms of your team, and that's really what's helped retain us. And I actually just fell victim of someone, and it was literally $70,000 on a new hire that left for another role. She was only on board for three months. And to be honest, it, I don't think it was about money. We had overshot in the role she was too senior for, it, and it was a lesson that I had. I But at the same time, she did feel a gap for me with a huge gap in comms she got a lot done in three months and now actually i don't have to have to backfill that position for another three so for me it kind of worked out but the rest of my team is the retention and what jamie said it's that vulnerability and the authenticity the team understands it's always explaining why if a goal is changing you know one of the things that our team always faces they're like well why are the revenue targets changing in q3 and explaining well if we missed you know a quarter not that we're missing but if we did miss this is why this is going to happen happen. And when we do achieve really applauding the team success, you know, I'm really fortunate, really rock star team and through my career I've had rock stars and it's consistently just growing them and molding them as well and giving them what, what they need to really take that next step. So I love that Jamie has lost people for CMO roles. That's, that's really cool. I haven't yet lost anyone to a CMO role, just VPs. So uh, maybe a couple more years I'll have. There that. you go. Something to aspire to. <laughs> yeah. And you know, what I, what I'm thinking about in all of this is is how much work you all are doing and paying attention, all the one-on-ones that you're doing, all the career mapping, all the sort of thinking ahead and helping them feel like you're a person that does it. And so this is the moment in the show where we ask, what would Ben Franklin say? And I think he would applaud all of the hard work that you're doing with this expression, industry pays debts while despair increases them. There's no point in whining about any of this. It's all about 
What can you do right now to keep your employees happy, build those teams, get them together? We've heard a lot of that uh, in our conversation today. Now, I want to flip it a little bit. And the flip side of retention is recruiting, right? Even if you keep all your people, you all have openings because you you have new headcount that you're adding because your company is growing. And I literally, this this just blew me away that the one CMO in a, in a huddle made three offers. This was for a product marketing position. All three accepted and and then all three uh, turned around and took better offers. <laughs> So what's working in recruiting besides throwing money at candidates? And let's start with Jamie. What's working in recruiting? It's a great question. It's almost a loaded question too, because I feel like for things that work, some things don't. For the VP role, sort of VP role I just filled, I think it's more, A, I was very picky about that role. And so it was a very long, lengthy process, but it was around just really being kind of tight on exactly who was the right fit for the role for our company. Because a lot of people had the right title, but it was around being the right fit for our company. And I think that is, depending on the role for that VP role, it was more around, I had a very constant kind of communication with the right candidates throughout the whole entire process. So making sure that, a, you know, even down to the point in the later stages, again, where it was made clear, like, if we're going to have a text, is it okay if I text you? That came later on when I knew that I was down to my few two or three. And I think as long as that was okay and that relationship was established, that helped. But I will say, I don't know if I know, even know what's working, Drew. I know that I went so far in this recruiting process. It's almost embarrassing, but it's such a funny story that I sent someone an edible arrangement. I was like, <laughs> what's that last mile thing I can do to say, we really want you. And I sent someone an edible arrangement. I mean, that is- You know, I mean, I think in this market, you really got to think about this like dating and, and you know- It's like what, dating. It is. And what's going to move this uh, relationship along? And edible fruit may have been the trick. That's hilarious. But I also heard you talk about hiring for culture fit, which I think is so interesting because that's so tricky today because you you want both culture fit, but you also want that person to bring something new to the culture. So that's tricky. Anyway, James, anything working for you in the recruiting area that you can add to this conversation? I'll pick up on the, I haven't tried the edible arrangement, but I, I took that <laughs> down as a note. I'll pick up on the uh, the, the culture bit there because I, I always make sure with, with candidates that um, they understand, and I'm very clear right on the interview, that you're interviewing me, I'm interviewing you, right? This is a two-way street, two-way dialogue. You really need to feel comfortable about this. So because we have spent so much time on our marketing team defining, as I mentioned earlier, you know, what our microculture is, what our mission is, how we work. I tend to run through that, right, with, with the candidate and let them, you know, feel comfortable with what they're going to be a part of and see if they, you know, how well they react to it, right? Are they going to like to be a part of, you know, our merry marketing team? Or are they, you know, going to self-select out? So I, I, again, I think in the recruitment process, being very open, very honest with the candidate about, the type of environment they're getting into. And then of course, you know, being clear on what the role and the objectives and, and, and all of that is, is critical. That I have found has both ha helped to get the right candidate, as well as make sure that those, you know, self-select out the ones that are like, nope, that's not for me. Right. All right. So Jamie, we seem to have lost Melissa. So let's go to this. I'm going to give you a magic wand. Budget's not an issue. What's your next hire in an area where you go? That would really be awesome if I could get that. Multiple field marketers. Okay. And why? I would say with our business, very strong enterprise motion. We have a really great sales and channel and then marketing has been kind of supporting. And I feel like we might be a little thin in areas. And if we had a couple more field marketers in specific regions, I know it's probably not traditional uh, to what people would say. I feel like that would have a little bit more connection on some of our markets where we're trying to put resources where there's just not a lot of resources. Right. So that's my, that's my personal need. And let me ask you this, because we were talking about this in a huddle that field marketing and used to be sort of like kind of somewhere between a salesperson and an event person. And now they really need to be marketers. I'm curious. So what is that role? What are they supposed to be doing for you? Our field marketers are basically forming relationships with anyone from sales to SDRs to running events, to running programs, to running you know syndication programs. They're very much holistically 
figuring out how do they put on an event, but how do they, even if it's an event that's already passed, how are we promoting that in other ways? How are we engaging the channel team? So I think it's very much becomes a more robust role for us in within sales with channel, but also bringing that back into programs for that specific market that they're in. All right. Well, we are running very close late in the hour. So James, give us one tip for your fellow CMOs on building a strong or stronger marketing team. Yeah, sure. I, I'd say, um, you know, let each of your, especially your directs, right? Let them drive their own destiny, help them, right? To create and define what that journey is, but make sure that you're giving them the support that they need let them sometimes make mistakes if that if, if they do but make sure everybody feels on on your team that they are running their show when you have that kind of attitude as a manager you, you'll find that your team always steps up and is grateful for the chance to to thrive uh, on their own. Yeah, I mean, and I think when we go back to the very early part of your conversation where you have se seven direct reports, the only way that's going to work is if they really are good at what they do and they can not make their own destiny. So that's, you've closed the loop for me. So I love that. Jamie, give us one tip for your fellow CMOs on building a stronger marketing team. I would say just making sure that you're investing in time to understand the different personalities and how everyone is interwoven and, you know, what are everyone's goals on the team? And so that everyone's clear that just because I have a goal to be X, my counterpart might not have that same goal in their role to be the same at the same level or have the same promotion, but it's understanding their value to the team. And I think that's more of outside of, you know, focusing on what initiatives are we driving this week, this month, this quarter. This is more of taking a step back and saying, hey, I want to spend time on really Really making sure that we understand each other as teammates, you know, more in an empathetic way. And so I think that has worked very well for myself and our team. And I would highly recommend that people invest creating that space and time to do that as well. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's funny. We got to the, almost the end of the hour and the word empathy, which I think has been such an important part of pandemic leadership. You know, I remember early on uh, a CMO saying, oh God, I really have to be empathetic now. And, and I suspect you always had to be, but never before four has that skill been tested in our world of just being empathetic. That's sort of number one. Number two, what we heard a lot of conversation today is about, it's not just about getting stuff done. It's about having, making sure that everybody shares the values and feels commitment to something bigger than say, um, we got another couple leads into the pipeline. So, all right, with that, I want to thank Melissa Goldberger, whose internet sort of failed her at the last minute. James, Jamie, you're great sports. Thank you to the audience for staying with us. I'm your host, Drew Neiser. And until next time, keep those renegade thinking caps on and strong.